Hey guys, thank you so very much for joining into this pre-recorded webinar called Seeing in the Spirit. I'm so thankful that you are a friend of Fireborn Ministries, and this is exclusively to everybody on our email list. One way or the other, you would opt it in. So thank you so very much for that, whether it was through one of our free downloadable PDFs, whether it was on the last days, prophetic activation, or three secrets to dialogue with the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for being part of Fireborn Ministries and staying up to date. I'm excited to be launching once again our webinars, but because of Wi-Fi uh, frequencies, signals, and things like that, and some of the transition that our family has been doing and moving and traveling, and even traveling here in the next month, month and a half, I wanted to pre-record this so you could watch this on your time. So it was a great summer of 2022. It's been a very great year so far. The favor of God has been poured out. We've seen God move in miracles, signs, and wonders. And uh, my wife and I celebrated 20 years of marriage together. And uh, we, we went on a mission trip together to the Dominican Republic and did some ministry there in the Bate, Bate Guajabo. And we believe that given those 40 uh, families food for about two weeks time, was just in time because a hurricane had ripped through there just a few weeks later. So we're still building up um, relationship there and talking to the people and, and looking at seeing a, about doing a full time or full on adoption of Bate Guajamo. Guajabo right there in the Dominican Republic. So there are other ministries that do work there, but we want to talk to them and see where we can uh, fill in and, and go regularly and bring teams there. But thanks again for being part of Fireborn Ministries. My wife, Rochelle, um, and I, uh, we've got four amazing kids right now. They're 17, 13, 13, and 10 years old. My wife has a worship single available on Amazon and on Apple Music. It's called My Way of Hope, and we'd started Fireborn Ministries together. Uh, I think we'd incorporated it as a nonprofit, 501c3, in the year 2012, and we exist to see Jesus awaken this generation to the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we provide the e-courses, the free e-course on the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we've had a couple of thousand students go through combined through our website, firebornministries.com or charismacourses.com. And it's just amazing to hear the testimonies of what God has done. We provide spirit-empowered coaching as well. We've seen people receive healing and deliverance and even the baptism of the Holy Spirit, whether it's through a Zoom call. Uh, such as this, or whether it's a phone call, people have testimonies of healing, of deliverance, of being set free, and of receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And we've always got the podcast Adventures in the Spirit, Jared Lasky, available on Charisma. We're currently on the tail end of season three. We've interviewed amazing people such as Elizabeth Time Fook, Bishop Bill Hammond, Patricia King, Sean Bowles, Scott Gilbert. My wife has interviewed me, um, and we loved it. We've talked about the prophetic, the apostolic, deliverance, healing, and we are not just information, but impartation and activation, as long as it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. But thanks again for being part of Seeing in the Spirit pre-recorded webinar. Let's invite the Holy Spirit in this time, because I'm going to go through some biblical things about seeing in the Spirit, but we'll also do some activation in the Spirit for you to get your spiritual senses activated. And I'd love for you to put in the comments below what God did in you. So it will be encouraging to us knowing that the Holy Spirit's doing something in you while you're watching this on your time. And it'll be encouraging to other students to see what they say and what you have to say about seeing in the Spirit and this webinar. So Holy Spirit, come. Right now, there's no distance between time or space. We pray, Holy Spirit, come glorify Jesus during this time as we learn how to see in the spirit. You get all the credit, you get all the fame, Jesus. You alone are to be glorified. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So what is seen in the spirit? Some people may ask, is this new age? What is this? Is this uh, a cult? Why would a Christian ministry be talking about seeing in the spirit? Someone may even ask, well, what is seeing in the spirit? Some Christians accept it, seeing in the spirit. Some people might just want to run away. But seeing in, in the spirit is biblical. We see it throughout the scripture, and we know it even experientially that God speaks to some people through their spiritual sight. So we'll get into more of that. But as Christians, I believe that we need to expand our language and define our vocabulary. We need this to be biblical. Too often, I think that we run away from what is rightfully ours. We read throughout the entire scripture and see that there are people called seers and there are prophets and people of God that he spoke to throughout the ages since the beginning of time. Throughout the scripture, people had dreams, vision, people heard God's voice, they obeyed, they encountered angels, they saw Christ before he was even born. You know, they People of faith took risks and saw God bring the breakthrough in their lives. And Hebrews chapter 11 talks about the hall of faith, how some people held on to these promises of God, never seen the fulfillment of the promise, but yet they are heroes of the faith because God did answer their prayers and God did bring forth the breakthrough and did follow through on the promise, even though they were unable to see the fulfillment or the promise come to pass, but they held on to the word of God for uh, our spiritual legacy. And I think that too many people dismiss that God still speaks, that, that people can still see in the Holy Spirit today. God's voice is as relevant today as it was in the Garden of Eden. God's spirit is just as powerful today as he was on the day of Pentecost. My ministry, our ministry, majors on the Holy Spirit, on the prophetic, on the person and presence of the Holy Spirit. A mentor of mine had said that uh, we should major on worship and minor on warfare, and I took that to heart. He started a church, and he'd had two church splits while pastoring because he dove a little too deep into spiritual warfare and deliverance, and things got crazy until he realized he was not doing deliverance and spiritual warfare biblically. He was doing it uh, just off the rails, and then he repented. He looked at what the scripture said, but he, he had told me, major on worship, minor on warfare. Now, I believe that there are spiritual battles that take place, but I am also confident to God calling you and me to serve him in all things. Amen. So the Holy Spirit is with us, and we are wearing the armor of God as a corporate body. And personally, we have the armor of God, but we need to major on worship, minor on warfare. I do do deliverance. Uh, I've seen it take place via Zoom and in person over the years, you know, but I, I want to focus. Our focus is on seeing Jesus awaken this generation, you and I, to the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we major on the Holy Spirit. Uh, I know that, that Fireborn ministry, Ministries may be unique. I mean, we're part of the diverse body of Christ. You know, um, I, I just love what he has us doing. You know, we don't have an edge on the Holy Spirit. We're just part of the kingdom of God, just like you, wanting to bring Jesus glory and bring Jesus fame. Uh, but we, we do focus on the personality of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, his reality, his presence, his power. And when demons do show up because the Spirit of God is more powerful and demons are shrieking in his presence, we will shut them down and cast them out. You know, it doesn't have to be a prolonged process. You know, Jesus cast demons out with a word. But uh, just recently, I'd actually coached uh, a man over Zoom who was set free from succubus and other spirits. And uh, this is very important. If you dabble or dive into deliverance ministry, when you empty a house, you need to fill the house. So always after 
seeing someone set free, a bunch of demons cast out, whether it's a legion or one or two evil spirits, always get someone filled with the Holy Spirit and then pray the fruit of the Spirit into them. Because once you've emptied the house, you need to fill the house. And we need to fill the house with the Holy Spirit, with scripture, with the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. So fill the house. And so um, I always do that. If someone does not have a spiritual prayer language after I've prayed for them and they've received deliverance, we will lead them and Jesus will baptize them with the Holy Spirit. If someone already has the baptism with the Holy Spirit, they already have a personal private prayer language, you know, we'll ask the Holy Spirit to give them joy, to give them peace, to fill them up from head to toe. So that is always very important. And actually what's exciting is that uh, the day after this gentleman was set free from, from succubus, you know, the next day a woman over the phone was set free from uh, tormenting thoughts. And then she was refilled with the Holy Spirit. And then another gentleman who I'd become acquainted with, gave me a phone call. He'd gone through the e-course, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he'd said, well, Jared, uh, you know, I finished the e-course, but I still don't have my, my prayer language yet. I still don't speak in tongues. And I was like about to say, well, watch that activation video again. But I felt the Holy Spirit say, pray now, pray now. So I said, let's pray right now for you to receive. And within less than a minute, the Holy Spirit baptized him and he spoke forth and praised Jesus in his newfound spiritual prayer language. And he's been develop developing that language every day in prayer. So that's exciting, guys. But let's zero in on seeing in the Spirit. You already know some of the, the things that Fireborn Ministries does, but when we're talking about the prophetic, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we also need to be open and aware of seeing in the Spirit. There are ways that the Holy Spirit communicates to us, and each of us uh, may have experienced it differently, uh, but we've all heard the voice of God in the way that we, re we responded to the gospel message. That may have been one of the first times that you heard God or sense God one way or another, the Holy Spirit convicting you to respond to the gospel message for your salvation. But we need to be open to seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling things in the spirit, because there are, just as there are five natural senses, there are five spiritual senses. And, and so we're discussing seeing in the spirit which when we see in the spirit, God can give us dreams. He can give us visions. He, we can have what people call flashes or images in order to edify the body of Christ and even see people come to Christ through a supernatural encounter. So we, we will be having some activations in this time. So I'm going to do some teaching, and then a spiritual activation for you to encounter the Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit to speak to you, and for you to see through this. So again, comment, comment what God was doing, or even email us, info at firebornministries.com. But in Exodus chapter 24, we see this incredible supernatural experience take place uh, in Exodus chapter four, 24, verses 1 through 2, and verses 9 through 11. This is a way to see in the Spirit. So in chapter 24 of the book of Exodus, verses 1 through 2, it says, Then he said to Moses, so God said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. And then verses 9 through 11 of Exodus chapter 24, it says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven, for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. And then we know that from this, Moses with Joshua went up the mountain and received the Ten Commandments. So this is some very profound thing here. They saw the God of Israel. They beheld God and ate 
and drank. In the Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I've done several years of Greek, of Koine Greek, uh, but I use some Bible, great Bible tools that you can use as well to kind of look, do some word studies in Hebrew and Greek or some of the Aramaic that the, the Bible was written in. But in the Hebrew, when it says that elders saw the God of Israel, the Hebrew word for see, to see, is ra'ah. They saw with their natural eyes, they saw the God of Israel and they ate and drank. They ate and drank. They fellowshiped with one another and they saw with their natural eyes the God of Israel. So I'd like you to close your eyes right now and ponder this just for about 15 seconds. They saw the God of Israel and they ate and drank. So let's close our eyes and ponder this. Amen. Amen. So here are these men, these leaders. Nadab, Abihu, Joshua, Moses. And they were experiencing something better than any entertainment, better than any TV show or series. They were seeing the God of Israel. And I believe with all my heart that this is a Christophany, that they didn't see God the Father, because we, when we look at Scripture, we know that Scripture needs to interpret Scripture, but we know that nobody has ever seen God the Father and lived besides the Son. But we see in the Scripture these Christophanies, where before the birth of Christ, Christ himself appeared in one form or another. When we see the capital letters in some of our Bibles, Angel of the Lord, we know that that is, is a Christophany, that is Christ himself, the Angel of the Lord before Christ the son was born. So this was better than any entertainment, better than any TV show or series. This Christophany of Jesus revealing himself as the God of Israel in the Old Testament. Scripture says that no one can look upon God the Father and live, but we have the honor and privilege and joy to be able to gaze on Jesus the Son. And so they were able to gaze on Jesus, the Son, the God of Israel. So uh, right now, right where you are, put your gaze, put your focus on Jesus and gaze on his face. He's so wonderful. He's so beautiful. So gaze on him and set aside time throughout the course of the day to gaze on Jesus. We can see into the spirit realm. This can be like through our natural eyes, like the elders of Israel here in Exodus chapter 24, seeing the God of Israel and eating and drinking, having fellowship with one another and seeing the God of Israel. So there are times where we can see supernatural things with our natural eyes. Um, I want to share a story about when I was I first started a church back when I was 19. I was with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, for about a year on a discipleship training school and mission trip and a school of ministry development with the mission trip. And then I returned home to start a youth pastoring and then go to Eugene Bible College. And then to also, within a year of that, kind of start a out community outreach center, a church, and uh, see God move in, in revival. Uh, and so here I was. 19 years old, and this, this young man had come to our meeting. I think his, his, uh, his dad was in the community. His dad was actually an elder of a local church. And here's this, this young man who's about 25 years old who uh, was seeing his dad, but he came to our church meeting as we had a lot of the youth and young adults in the community coming to our revival meetings and prayer meetings. So this, this man came and uh, he was addicted to drugs and huffing chemicals. And there was actually a moment when uh, he had gone outside and sat in his car. And through the window, I was like, who is the lady 
in the car with him. Who's that lady in the passenger seat? And my team was like, Jared, nobody's here with him. There's nobody in that passenger seat. And my friend, so my friends kept saying, there's no one there. But I was seeing it through my natural eyes that there looked to me like there was a female in the passenger seat of his car that he was talking to. They still said, no, Jared, there's nobody with him. But I knew what I was seeing. The man did come back inside and we started praying over him. And he had admitted to us that he was huffing some chemicals. Uh, and as we laid hands on him, he became instantly sober. And then he told us this, he told the whole group this, that he had been on a cross country trip and he received a visitor, a supernatural female, a lady. So people can call it an imaginary friend, a evil spirit. This entity, this spirit would not leave him since he went on the, a cross country trip. So my friends, they looked at me with their eyes wide open and we asked him if he wanted to be free. And if he would consent for this evil spirit to leave him, and he said yes. So freedom happened for him that day. And soon he was water baptized. His dad got to water baptize him. I, I believe it was at the Dexter Lake. Uh, and he entered into discipleship as his dad was, again, an elder of a local church. But this was an encounter, one of the first times where I saw with my natural eyes, I saw something spiritual. Now, I'd had some visions before this. Actually, my first vision, I was in Youth with a Mission. I was uh, there just for like a couple of weeks, and I underwent like this demonic spiritual attack, and and uh, I knew I needed this. I needed someone to pray with me because I didn't know what was going on, you know, uh, and the staff, I was praying for a staff member to show up, and the staff member stepped out of the room, and I, and I told him, Hung Sam here's what's going on. And so I told him all this, this crazy stuff that was going on with a uh, spiritual attack. And then he, he took me up to this, this area about 25 feet away. And he's like, well, if it, it doesn't bring you peace, it's not from God. And then we started praying. And then he taught me rebuking the devil. And the moment I did that, it was like a, a t movie screen popped down in front of me. So in, uh, with my natural eyes, like this movie screen popped out as transparent i could see through it but i could see this image of this dead tree this dead tree that then sprung to life and numerous fruits started popping all over it and i believe that that dead tree was me and then i sprung to life within a few weeks i received the baptism of the holy spirit and i've never been the same since life has had its ups and downs and uh, brutal things like that but you know i was never the same and so that was one of my first open visions. So an open vision is seen in the spirit as well. So seeing in the spirit is receiving spiritual revelation through your spiritual sight or perceiving information from the spirit realm visually. And you could see it in your mind, in your heart, you could see it. Like when you close your eyes, you could see, or sometimes you could see it through your natural eyes. In 2 Kings chapter, chapter 6, uh, we, we see the story here uh, that is taking place between Elijah and his students. So in 2 Kings chapter 6, I'll start at verse 8, and then we'll go down uh, probably to verse 17 or 18. It says, once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with the servant, saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are going there too. And the king of Israel sent to the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him, so that he saved himself there more than once or twice. So here's this prophet of God seeing and preventing uh, the, the king of Israel to be attacked. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? He, here he is. He's thinking he's got spies. Verse 12. And one of the servants said, none, my Lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And he said, go and see where he is that I may send and seize him. It was told him, told to the king, behold, he is in Dothan. 
So verse 14, so he sent their horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. In verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning, and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around. So the, the Hebrew word here, open or open the eyes, when Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Gehazi's eyes, was pakach, open, open the eyes, his eyes, which are his mental and spiritual capacities. And then Yahweh opens his spiritual eyes. The prophet Elisha was already aware of the spirit realm around him, whether or not he could see in it or not, which I believe he, he was able to, you know, he was still aware and knew that the armies, the spiritual armies around him were, were greater than the natural armies surrounding to come get him from prophesying for the king of Israel and preventing the king of Syria from attacking him and, and there'd be great loss. But Gehazi's eyes were opened to see the supernatural fire, the chariots, the hosts of heaven, the angelic realm around him. We call that the spirit realm. And some people call that the second heaven. Uh, I think that uh, real soon, I'll give you guys another seminar on the three heavens and you. But right now, I want us to focus on Jesus and be activated as we'll have an activation. So I want you to focus on Jesus and ask him to open your spiritual eyes to see. We worship God. We worship Jesus. We only worship, you know, the three in one. We worship the Holy Spirit. He is the one who initiates this. But our faith participates and he honors that and he blesses our faith. So I want to share like a five-step process for this spiritual activation. I want you to uh, start kind of, clo well, close your eyes, worship Jesus, and start focusing on him. And it might start off real faint, and some people might think that it's their spiritual imagination, but maybe an image, uh, might you might start seeing that, but just start focusing on, in on it as you're worshiping Jesus, and then let uh, the Holy Spirit initiate these things, and, and as you start walking through this and, and encountering seeing in the Spirit, and let it grow in your spiritual eyes. Let's ask Jesus to reveal angels around you in the space that you're at right now. Ask Jesus to reveal angels around you. Angels work and operate around us, they're messengers, they're protectors, they're warriors. They minister to those who will inherit salvation. That is you and me. And when we ask, uh, maybe something will flash. Maybe uh, you'll, you'll sense something. You know, grab a hold of that and look in the spirit in that direction. As we seek Jesus to open our spiritual eyes to see, to see the angels around us. So admire and adore God. Admire and adore God alone and worship Jesus. Ask Jesus for the, for the name of the angel. Ask Jesus for the name of the angel that it's in that space with you. There could be more than one. And then see what the meaning of that name is. You could uh, search it online. I don't want you to go to any new age sites or anything like that, but there are some great name dictionaries. You know, see what the meaning of that name is. So uh, as you close your eyes and you focus on Jesus, the first step is to tell him, thank you, Jesus. Tell him, thank you that there are angels around us. There are angels in this, in this place. There are angels in this room. So thank you, Jesus. Now the second step, ask Jesus, Jesus, where's the angel in this room? The third step, ask Jesus, Jesus, will you show me what the angel looks like? And 
Now ask Jesus, Jesus, what is the angel's name? And now ask Jesus, step five, Jesus, what is the angel here for? Love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Thank you. Okay, I'd, I'd encourage you guys, comment below what took place during the spiritual activation. You know, mention what you saw, mention the name, mention what Jesus is doing in you right here, right now. Isn't that amazing? I love that. I love that. Because just right here, right to my left, there's an angelic messenger. So as we proceed with this, seeing in the spirit, I don't want us to get hung or stuck up on the title seers. Seers were prophets who saw spiritually. God spoke to the seers through their spiritual eyes or even through their natural eyes. It's still spiritual. And that's one of the main ways that God communicated uh, to them. They that's one of the main ways that they saw or heard God speak. God communicated them through seeing in the spirit. It wasn't the only way that he communicated to them, but I believe that it was a primary way that he spoke to what the Bible calls seers. So it's probably the most common means of communication that he had for them. But seeing didn't make them superior or better than the prophets or people that God speaks to in a still small voice. He could speak to you in a still small voice. Amen. <laughs> Seers, again, I don't want us to get stuck on this title, that this has a title or get stuck on this term because seers was a term only used in the Old Testament for a small window of time, just a few hundred years. The language or vo vo vocabulary in Israel was changed for a short period of time, calling some prophets seers and then other prophets prophets, but just talking about it in the primary way that God spoke to them. So go see the seer, go to the seer. But this is only a small window of time where there was a differentiation between prophets who heard God in other ways and prophesied, and then seers who could see in the spirit or God was speaking to them through their spiritual sight and still prophesied. But for some reason, people go by these titles seer as a prophet today i was recently part of an ordination over skype and they'd asked me what my title was and i said jared lasky <laughs> a great prophet by the name of bob laughlin had told me once that titles are unnecessary when you're with people they'll just know the topic will come up the conversation will go that way god will move so it's, it's your prerogative if you want a title like seer prophet or listening prophet or super galactic universal apostle, go for it. <laughs> if that's what you want. But we don't need the way God communicates us to be our title. We don't need the way that God communicates to us to be in our title. Yes, there are apostles, there are prophets, there are evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the fivefold ministry. And those are not handed out easily. Okay, there's a great sacrifice and price that people paid to be in a fivefold ministry office. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, 12, and 13, which is for the equipping of the saints and the maturity of the body. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers exist to equip the saints for ministry. That's all of us. They equip us to do what Jesus did in our daily lives. But there's a great price to pay to be an apostle, prophet, one of the fivefold ministries. And we don't necessarily need those offices to be a title, but it's your prerogative. You could have that. But maybe. You might even alternate. I know uh, I've interviewed some great people who alternate between uh, an apostle and evangelist. You know, they, they alternate, but they walk in that apostolic office. You know, I know prophets who are more, who could be very evangelistic. So they're prophetic and evangelistic. 
you know, some people are just great teachers. Some people are great pastors, you know, but sure, it's, it's our prerogative to go by a title or not. So for me, I just want you to know I'm Jared. And if we start having a conversation and the prophetic gets brought up or someone starts talking about dreams and visions, we'll flow with that. Or if there needs to be some evangelism, we'll flow with that and see what the Holy Spirit has for us. Amen. But I think it's very important that we see that the title seers is no longer a biblical term or title. It only lasted for a few hundred years. Okay, and that's in the Old Testament. And now in the New Testament, we have the fivefold ministry offices, Ephesians 4, 11, 12, and 13. But we see in the Old Testament, uh, there are some seers such as Gad, Samuel, and Asaph. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 29, it says, Now the acts of King David from first to last are written in the chronicles of Samuel the seer, and in the chronicles of Nathan the prophet, and in the chronicles of Gad the seer. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 30 says, And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshiped. So this is kind of interesting in that here's Asaph the seer, who's also a worshiper. Worship is always very important if we minister in any of the spiritual gifts, uh, whether it's the prophetic, whether it's tongues, whether it's administration, whether it's mercy, whether it's healing, whatever spiritual gift it is, leadership, we need to be rooted and grounded in worship, in worship, praising Jesus, worshiping him. Uh, humbling ourselves before him you know so here's uh asaph a musician musician along the same as david king david it is telling that the praises that the levites were singing were the psalms and songs of david but also of the seer asaph so worship 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 intimacy 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 with god is of the utmost importance to all of us no matter our call, our function, our office, our job, we should worship and be close to King Jesus. Make it a daily habit. Daily set aside time to worship him, to talk to him, to communicate with him. Kings had seers in their courts, as we see in the Bible. David had seers. Second Samuel chapter 24, verses 11 through 12, it says, When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, and again, bad news followed. But David had a seer. So imagine if our government or our churches had the fivefold ministry offices on staff on hand. Not just a pastor centric church or hierarchy, but fivefold prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors, apostles on hand to see, hear, sense, feel, and know what God is doing in our church daily operations, in our government, in our politics. Imagine the difference that would make. Second Chronicles chapter 29, verse 25. It says, he then stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with harps, and with lyres, according to the command of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For the command was from the Lord through his prophets. And then 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, it said, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, come, let us go to the seer, for he, is, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. There was a vocabulary change during that time. Vocabulary change in the office and the function did not. The way God communicates has been the same all these thousands of years later. And seeing is for you. And how do I know that seeing is for you, that you can see in the spirit? Numbers chapter 11, verse 25 through 30. It says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. When the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. However, two men whose names were Eldad and Medad had remained in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the spirit also rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. 
Joshua, son of Nun, who'd been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. So Moses' prayer, his desire, is that the Lord put his spirit on all the Lord's people, that all the Lord's people were prophets. And this prayer was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost, the birth of the Christian church and power and the prophetic outpouring of the Spirit for all who call on the name of the Lord. As Jesus' successors, all the gifts and operations of the Holy Spirit are available for you. We seek the face of Jesus. We draw near to him, and he trains us and uses us in his spiritual gifts. And the dunamis power of the Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which is then poured out in Acts chapter 2, which is God's strength, God's power, God's ability through us, all the gifts, all the operations of the Spirit are available to us, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, touching, all the spiritual senses because of the Spirit of God dwelling within us. We have access through Christ Jesus, through his shed blood on the cross. He is the door. He is the way. He's the only way. We have access. And the moment we give our lives to him, we receive the Holy Spirit. And then we receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We, we receive spiritual gifts and we move and operate in them. And we grow in our relationship with him. And we grow in our spiritual senses. We can grow in seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling. He opens the eyes of our heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. The eyes of our heart. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. You know, there's this beautiful song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. For years, I didn't really know what that meant. Until eventually I had a supernatural revelation of what the eyes of our heart are. Our spirit. The eyes of our heart open to see, to hear. Ephesians chapter 1 my Bible to Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18 it says I pray also this is the apostle Paul I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe that power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority power and dominion and every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in the one to come and god placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church which is his body the fullness of him fills everything in every way so verse 18, the, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened or opened. The word for eyes here in the Koine Greek is ophthalmos, the eye, figuratively the mind's eye. And in the context of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul is talking about the spiritual eyes, the eyes of the heart, the mind's eye. So just as there are five natural senses of sight, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, there are supernatural or spiritual senses. And he's praying that the eyes, their spiritual eyes are open, that these Christians can see in the spirit and they can have a greater revelation of Jesus through what they see. This is all to encounter the Lord. Our heart, our spiritual heart, is where there are thoughts, there are feelings, there are senses, there are knowings. But our, our heart is focused and on the affection of Christ Jesus. 
opening the eyes of our heart has a purpose. There's an intention. It's not just to see cool stuff in the heavenlies or the spirit realm or know certain strategies, okay? To see in the spirit is not to think that you're better than someone else. I've seen too many people say, well, I see and you only hear, so I'm great. No, you're not great or not at all. Be a little more humble. God speaks to you that way. Awesome. Celebrate it. God speaks to them a certain other way, primarily. Celebrate it. Celebrate. We're all in the same kingdom. No competition here. Let's advance the kingdom of God together. Amen. But opening the eyes of our heart is to see the hope to which he has called you, the riches of the glorious inheritance that you and I receive as saints. It is to know your identity, know your inheritance, but most importantly, to know Jesus. If you're in Christ, you have the legal right, the legal access to see, hear, taste, touch, and smell in the spirit. You have spiritual senses, spiritual knowing, spiritual and supernatural access and blessing for your spiritual inheritance to bring heaven to earth, to be the kingdom of God everywhere that you go, to know that you're a carrier of the anointing, you're a carrier of the art of the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and everywhere you go, Jesus is with you, and you carry the kingdom, and you could see, you could prophesy, you could speak life, you could rule and reign and have dominion, knowing that you're seated with Christ far above all principalities and powers. You're seated with him in heavenly places, and the enemy is below you. You trample on snakes and scorpions. You trample on the demonic. The Lord's prayer was for heaven to come to earth and heaven can come to earth because you are the legal carrier of God's presence. You are the legal carrier of God's power. You are an open door. You are an open heaven. So wherever you go, you bring heaven to earth. Psychics and new agers know some of these principles. But their assignments and their powers are from the counterfeit. There's no comparison between what God has and what the devil offers. They, the New Age, the psychics, the occult, they're operating in the supernatural realm illegally. And sooner or later, the devils will have them pay up. The devils come to collect. But what they see, what they hear, it's nothing. It doesn't, it does not resemble the truth. It may seem legit. It may deceive people. It may make them a lot of money for a time, but the enemy will come to collect. What they offer is deceptive. What they offer is harmful and it binds them and it torments them. But by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, the Holy Spirit abides in you and around you and among you. You have the legal right, the inheritance, the access to bring heaven to earth, to see in the spirit. You're a son, you're a daughter of the king. And because of Jesus, you can see. He will communicate with you because he loves you. He loves you. He loves all of his kids. For this next activation, we're going to exercise our spiritual sight. The Hebrew word to see is ra to see, to gaze, to look upon, to perceive. So look upon Jesus. This is what I want to do. I'll, I'll read some biblical passages. As you're focused on Jesus, I want you to press into this. Close your eyes. You could play some soft worship music if you'd like. You know, but put all your focus on Jesus and start seeing this. I think Christians tend to be a little too scared to, you know, uh, 
use our imaginations or see while we're reading the Bible. But when you read a fiction novel, don't you see it? When you watch a movie about a novel that you read, don't you say, that's not the way I saw it. That's not the way I pictured it. Guys, this is one of the ways that we exercise our spiritual sight is reading it, putting ourselves in the pages, uh, being encountering it, using our imaginations and then seeing. And then when we go to prayer, we start receiving more supernatural revelation because we're renewing our mind of Romans chapter 12, verses one through two. We're renewing our minds. We're getting rid of the filth. We're focusing on good things, on all that is good and great and holy and just. We're walking in the fruit of the spirit and we're, we're cleansing ourselves from the world and pursuing Christ Jesus and seeing what he wants to, to show us. So we're going to, to do that now as you close your eyes and focus on Jesus. I'm going to read some biblical passages in Exodus chapter 24, Revelation 1, uh, Revelation 4, and uh, Revelation 21. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars, according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of, of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up in, into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. And following, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was that on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a vo loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And around the throne on each side of the th throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behold, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is a second death. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates, 12 angels and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth the 12th amethyst and the 12 gates were 12 pearls each of the gates made of a single pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass and i saw no temple in the city for its temple is the lord god the almighty and the lamb and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of god gives it light and its lamp is the lamb by its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. So I want to encourage you guys. We've done 
two activations. Comment in the comments section what God did. Comment what you saw, what you felt, what you sensed, what was taking place. Comment what the Holy Spirit was doing in you as you focused on Jesus. And we'll respond. I will personally respond to you. You can even email us, info at firebornministries.com if you have any questions. But I'm going to end this here and do a part two of this as this is a series for seeing in the spirit. And for the next one, I want to talk about the three heavens and you. What is the third heaven? What are three heavens? <laughs> Start looking it up in the Bible. And the, the next one, we'll talk more about seeing in the spirit and the third heaven, the three heavens and you. And we will have more activations for you to see in the spirit. So thank you so very much for being part of Fireborn Ministries. Thank you so much for praying for us. And for those of you that partner with us, we love you so much. Lives are being changed this side of eternity as we're seeing people saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, set free as we're feeding the poor. And God is doing great things because you're praying for us and you're sowing seed into this ministry. So thank you so very much.